Hello, marine biology students. In this video, we're going to talk about the physiology and behavior of fish. So now that we've learned the types of fish, let's learn about their functions. So one aspect of fish has to do with their coloration patterns, and there are a few general themes. The first is countershading. This is the case where the dorsal surface is darker than the ventral or belly surface. When seen from above, the darker coloration of the dorsal surface blends in with the darker color of the ocean bottom. When seen from below, the lighter ventral surface blends in with the lighter color of the ocean surface. And so in this way, they are camouflaged both from above and below. A more striking visual pattern is disruptive coloration. which could include bars or stripes that help break up the silhouette of the fish for predator avoidance. There is cryptic coloration. Which is used for camouflage and blending into the background, whereas warning coloration is more an advertising of one's presence to let predators know that you are poisonous. So looking at some of these coloration patterns, the shark and the tuna that we had seen earlier has that countershading with a more darkly colored upper surface or dorsal surface and a lightly colored undersurface. In figure A, you might have a hard time even seeing the rockfish on the bottom because its cryptic coloration is so matching that of the sea floor. Whereas a parrotfish rarely matches its environment, but this disruptive coloration might make it more difficult for a predator to tell where exactly the body is and where the body isn't. The lionfish is showing warning coloration in that it is very poisonous and does not want larger fish to attempt to eat it. Not only do fish vary in their color, they also vary in their overall body shape. And these body shapes vary based on habitat and lifestyle. Fish can have different swimming habits, different feeding habits, and these can all lead to different body shapes. Tuna, billfish, and other fast-moving predators are more likely to be streamlined, with their fins serving as rudders. Not only do fish have different body shapes, they have different means of moving as well. Often, swimming is in a typical S-shaped pattern, where most of the thrust is coming from the tail. Bands of muscle along the body of the fish, known as myomeres, end up driving that swimming motion. However, different fins are used for different types of forward movements. Some will use their pectoral fins, some will use their dorsal fins, Others will use their tails. The gas-filled swim bladder of bony fish provide buoyancy. And the pectoral fins are usually not used for lift in bony fish as they are in sharks. Sharks do not have a swim bladder, but they do have a large lipid-filled liver, which helps it with buoyancy. Sharks tend to sink when not in motion, but the large and stiff pectoral fins provide lift. The pectoral fins in many bony fish are flexible and used for maneuverability. And in some slow swimming species, forward movement is mainly provided by the pectoral fins. Here we see a diagram of the general body shape for sharks and bony fish, and we can see differences in the pectoral fins, and that presence of a swim bladder helps bony fish with their buoyancy, whereas the heterocircle tail and the stiff pectoral fins help provide sharks with lift. Whether we're talking about chondrichthians or osteichthians, all fish have gills, and these gills are the equivalent of lungs for animals on land. 
These gills allow for gas exchange with the environment. The construction of the gills is the same in all fish. The gill arch provides support, whereas the gill rakers are on the outer surface of the gill arch. The gill filaments trail behind the gill arch. And in this diagram, we can see the flow of oxygenated water over the capillaries. The way the gills are organized is that the blood will be oxygenated as it moves between the major vessels. Diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place along the capillaries located in the lamellae that cover the gill filaments. The efficiency of the diffusion of oxygen from high concentration to in the water to low concentration in the blood is increased because water flow across the lamellae is the opposite direction to the blood flow. The concentration of oxygen in the water is always higher than that in the blood. And so diffusion promotes that movement of the oxygen into the blood. The mouth of the fish tells us a lot about its diet because it will be specialized. The beak or fused teeth of parrotfish is used for grazing on algae and coral. The long tube-like mouth of the butterfly fish is perfect for feeding on individual coral polyps or plankton. and the rows of sharp teeth and wide mouth of the barracuda captures its prey, other fish. So the morphology of the mouth tells us about the organism's food source. The intestine, pyloric cica, pancreas, and liver all secrete digestive enzymes to aid in the digestion of food. The intestines of carnivorous fish tend to be short and straight, whereas the intestines of herbivorous fish are usually longer and more coiled because plant and algal material is more difficult to digest. And so here we can compare the organization of the digestive system of a cartilaginous fish and a bony fish. Fishes have a two-chambered heart. This pumps blood throughout the body, in contrast to the four-chambered heart of mammals and birds. Arteries, veins, and capillaries take blood to the body tissues and return it for reoxygenation and release of carbon dioxide into the water by the gill filaments. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are carried by the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. So unlike the two circuits of blood flow that we see in mammals, fish have only a single circuit of blood flow, where oxygenated blood from the gills travels to the rest of the body, gas exchange occurs, deoxygenated blood returns to the heart, and the heart sends that blood back to the gills to repeat the process over again. Because of diffusion, solutes and gases always diffuse from a high concentration towards a low concentration. Marine fish are living in an environment where the seawater has a high salt concentration than that of their blood. So marine fishes have a tendency to lose water and gain solutes. Marine fish therefore need to osmoregulate to prevent dehydration. For marine fish, many swallow seawater. 
but excrete the excess solutes or salts through their kidneys or intestine. Most marine fish pass very little but concentrated urine to conserve water. The opposite is observed in freshwater fish. Cartilaginous fish, on the other hand, solve the problem by keeping their blood at about the same concentration as the seawater. This is accomplished by keeping urea in the blood. Urea is a toxic metabolic substance that results from the breakdown of proteins. Urea is excreted by the kidneys and other vertebrates. This means that there is a smaller tendency to lose water and gain solutes in cartilaginous fish than in bony fish because the internal and external conditions are more similar in cartilaginous fish than in bony fish. This also means that most cartilaginous fish are not especially tasty or good to eat without some sort of treatment to remove that excess urea. So the solute concentration in the blood of a cartilaginous fish is usually more similar to that of the seawater than the blood of a bony fish. Fish are vertebrates and therefore have a complex nervous system. They have a brain, spinal cord, and numerous nerves like other vertebrates. They have an olfactory sac. for detecting chemical compounds in the water. They have taste buds on their mouth, lips, barbels, and skin. In fish eyes, the position of the lens changes like in a camera. Color vision has evolved in many bony fish, and some sharks have a nictitating membrane that can protect their eyes during feeding. All fish rely heavily on their lateral line system, which is a series of pores and canals lined with cells known as neuromasts. That are specialized to detect vibrations. These vibrations can indicate a predator or prey or the position of other fish in a school. Many fish also have sensory organs within their inner ears. These are fluid-filled canals with sensory cells similar to the lateral line. And as we had mentioned with chondrichthians, they have the ampullae. Of Lorenzini, which allow them to detect electrical charges. This can be very helpful in finding prey, especially in murky water. So here we can see the lateral line, its general paths, along with the neuromast cells that detect the vibration. Then not to mention the ampullae of Lorenzini that allow sharks to detect electrical signals. Schooling is a behavior that is seen in many types of fish, but not all of them. There are about 4,000 species which will school as adults, although many more fish school as juveniles. Schooling makes it possible for small fish to appear much larger and thus avoid detection by predators, as well as making it harder for a predator to capture any one fish. Many fish school as juveniles. Fish will often have different patterns as they are swimming in a school, whether they're traveling in the same direction, feeding on plankton, encircling a predator, or also avoiding a predator. Some fish are very territorial. They establish and defend their territories at all times. Others might only be territorial during reproduction. Fish normally maintain their territories by showing aggressive behaviors called posturing. 
This can include raising fins, opening mouth, darting, and even producing sound. Fights between individuals are actually rare. Some fish species migrate. between freshwater and saltwater at different times in their lives. Anadromous species. Such as salmon, lampreys, and sturgeon live in seawater, but migrate to freshwater to reproduce. Whereas catadromous species live in freshwater, but travel to sea for reproduction. Here we see the migration pattern of freshwater eels, both in Europe and North America. These freshwater eels travel to the Sargasso Sea for reproduction, and yet the larvae then return home into their appropriate continent and water basins. When it comes to reproduction, sex hormones control the development of sperm and egg. The release of sex hormones can be cued by water temperature, day length, tidal cycle, among others. Broadcast spawning. Is the release of sperm and egg directly into the water for fertilization, and this is most common for marine fish. Some fish do have internal fertilization. in which the sperm is inserted directly into the female by the male. Some species have complex mating behaviors, which are called courtship. Courtship behaviors can be very choreographed, from the female entering the territory to the male catching her attention, they swim together, and finally, copulation occurs. A somewhat typical feature of fish reproduction is that of biological sex reversal during the course of an individual's life. Proto-Andry is when individuals are male first and develop into females later in life. Protogyny is when individuals start as females and then later develop into males. These biological sex reversals can even happen multiple times during the course of an individual's life. Most races are born as males, and they are males through juvenile stages and early adulthood, but once they reach a certain size, they become females. Yet of those females, the largest converts back into something known as a super male, and that super male will typically lead a, a harem or a female fish, but again, the larger of those female fish might also turn into males. The cues for these changes are often the result of changes in social structure or environment. In some anemone or clownfishes, a large female mates only with the largest male. If the dominant female dies, the largest male then develops into the new female. As we had seen with chondrichthians, fish can be viviparous, oviparous, or ovoviviparous. Meaning the young are either born live, in the case of viviparous, eggs are laid, in the case of oviparous, or eggs are kept within the female and hatch before being released from the female's reproductive tract in the case with ovoviviparous. In most bony fish, eggs are laid by thousands or millions and are not protected by the parents. In other bony fish, sometimes small numbers of eggs are laid and the parents protect the eggs. Most reproduction involves external fertilization. That's the case with broadcast spawners. However, internal fertilization can happen and is especially common in the cartilaginous fish. 
This chart compares some of the features of the common fish types, from the agnathans, which are in the hagfish and lampreys, the cartilaginous fish, the rays and skates and sharks and ratfish, and the bony fish, the osteichthyans. While a lot of the details of this chart are too small to see in this slide, I would highly encourage you to go to table 8.1 in your book to look and compare these different types of fish. So that completes our discussion of fish physiology and behavior. Now, something I'd like you to consider before our next video is if you had the choice between living in water or on land, which would you choose? We'll talk about that in the next video.